Here we go, changing your world. Closer than you think. When I first began entertaining this dream and envisioning that God wants us to be a part of him changing our world, I thought in this country, in this church, for me right now, that sounds more like a pipe dream than an achievable reality. Speaking of a pipe dream, did you know the phrase pipe dream came into being? It was believed it originated about 18 and 90, and it was referenced in a person who must be smoking opium in a pipe when they spoke of seemingly unachievable goals and the outlandish being achievable. Now, to put it in today's vernacular, you must be smoking crack. Hearing this dream, you probably are one of Joseph's brothers who made light of his dream. And when they saw him coming, they sarcastically called him the dreamer. They said, do you actually think that we're going to bow, that you're going to rule over us and we're going to bow to you? Or maybe we're like Joseph's father. When Joseph told his dream to Jacob, Jacob scolded him. Often when our vision sounds so far off, so near impossible, that it draws the sharpest criticism. We may be referred to as the dreamer. A dream, a vision begins with an honest assessment of what is, a mental image of what it could be, and the faith to follow God, making it what he would have it to be. I have assessed the state of the church and the condition of our nation. As I read the book of Acts and as I study the history of awakenings or revival, I gain a mental image of what could once again be. God is raising up his people with spiritual sand who are seeking the Holy Spirit to do what God wants to be done. And I believe this is where we find ourselves right now, God raising up people who are hungry for the holy. As you probably can imagine, my arguments and argumentative mood began when I considered the Holy Spirit is calling me to be one of those thousands that will lead Christians in changing our world. My response was similar to God telling a very old Sarah she was going to have a baby. She laughed. Here's my abbreviated list of arguments with God. When I started thinking that I'm actually, or maybe I begin asking, am I actually being called to do this? It's one thing to have it in here, but it's another thing to get in front of people and begin speaking this stuff. And so I begin asking myself, am I actually called to do this? Is this a pipe dream, or is this a call of God? There are things that was in my own life that I said, well, Lord, this needs to be changed in my own life. And, and I, I told the Lord, there's things that the Bell Fountain First Church of God that needs changing. And then I thought there were things in the disciples' life that needed changing when God called them to change the world. So, beloved, if we're waiting for us to get ready, if we're waiting for us to get in the right position, we'll never get there. Hey, our world is desperate. Our world is desperate. We have the answer in Jesus Christ. Let's go. My line of arguments took on other angles, like my mind isn't sharp enough. If you all say amen, I will call you out. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
My, my, yeah, somebody said it. Somebody said it under your breath back there. Come on, okay. So, so I begin arguing with the Lord. Lord, my mind isn't sharp enough. My body isn't strong enough. My energy level isn't high enough. The people I lead isn't ready enough. And on the list went. And once again, I believe the Holy Spirit witnessed to my inner spirit, and he simply said, but I am more than enough. Not being able to arrive at a comfortable culture, seeking resources, trying to discern the mind of God. All the while, I'm telling the Lord, Lord, if I start speaking this stuff and you ain't doing this stuff, I'm going to look really uninformed and ignorant, and that's putting it mildly. Before you dismiss this vision, I want to read you a story in the New Testament that suggests that we have a better handle on it and we are closer to changing our world than we might think we are. Hear the word of the Lord, Acts 16, beginning with verse 29. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Now listen. Men, husbands, Fathers, I want you to grasp something here. You are God's appointed priest for your house. And I'm telling you, when we begin to grasp that, we may realize, you know what? This thing is doable. Come on, let me read the rest of this. Along with every, you shall be saved along with everyone in your house. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Yes, there was still work to be done in order to change the world. But the work was well underway for the Philippian jailer to change his world. His wife, him, his children, and everybody that lived in the house was transformed by Christ. Beloved, their world just got changed. Hearts were changed, the house was changed, a jail was changed, the vocation was changed, and those residing in that world with them and around them was changed. The marketplace in Philippi looked different, the neighborhood looked different, there was a change, the jailer became a new creation, and the old was gone, and the new had come, and in many respects, his world just got changed. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think we can do this. Come on, amen. Yes, in order for the world to change as as it needs to change, a much broader, greater impact for Christ values must extend beyond just those that live in our house. But this is how we change the world. One heart, one home, one classroom, one church, one community at a time. Fathers and mothers, If you'll get serious about living for Jesus Christ and less about walking after the flesh, we would be shocked at how much of the world God would change now, right now, immediately. I got to tell you, I have never seen us Christians be so controlled by the flesh as we are in 2022. Man. 
The God who changed our hearts, the God who has changed our houses, has got to find his way into the hearts and houses of those that haven't been changed. And we who have been changed must take him there. And this is where the change in our world loses significant momentum. Yet there is enough God in each of us to change the world. Our challenge is to let God loose to work through us. So the question is, just how much God is in each born-again believer? Here's what the word of the Lord says. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got enough of the power of God to change the world already in you. Come on, amen. Or if that's too much, just say uh, what he said. A few weeks back, Drew asked a, a group of high school students, If they thought their world needed changing, they enthusiastically raised their hands. Drew asked if they wished someone would change it. Once again, there was an enthusiastic response of hands being lifted. But when they was asked, would you help change it, the response was more subdued. And I wonder, mom and dad, if they didn't learn that, grandpa and grandma, if they didn't learn some of that from me and you. The truth is, some Christians don't think changing our world is an option. Some don't think God changing this country is in his sovereign cards. Others see it as being beyond change. What's the use? We've gone too far. There are those who think it needs to be and they believe it can be. They think God wants it, but they simply feel helpless in how. That's probably how most of us, not all, Most of us think about this thing of changing the world. But wait just a minute. So if that's how you feel, if that's what you got going on, how how do we change this world? I feel helpless. I I don't know how. how. How do we change this world? Lloyd Ogilvy writes, and I quote, because I'm telling you, with that thought process, listen up, I feel helpless. With that thought process, We are in a better position to launch than if we thought we knew how to change the world. Lloyd Ogilvy writes, and I quote, each time we acknowledge our inadequacy, the Holy Spirit feels our emptiness to carry out Christ's ministry and mission. And then listen to this statement. When the needs of the world breaks our heart and the adequacy of the gospel grasp our mind, the Holy Spirit has us right where he wants us. Do you believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? And if so, great. But can you, can you look at your world, your neighborhood, your community, and doesn't it break your heart? When that happens, you are right where the Holy Spirit wants you. The gospel has the power to change our world, and our world is so broken. And how can they believe except they hear? And how can they hear if somebody don't tell them? And more importantly, if somebody don't show them. How do we change the spiritual temperature of this nation? How do we change the moral darkness of this country? How do we suppress the reign of evil and hate and institute the rule of love, righteousness in our community? How? Here it is, and we're going to talk about it. We don't change the moral darkness of this country We first change the spiritual temperature of this church, and that changes the moral darkness of this country. (laughs) 
So if the spiritual temperature of 1000 Brown Avenue, and if the, and if the spiritual temperature at West Liberty and the spiritual temperature at Cross Star King, the spiritual temperature at Vineyard, the spiritual temperature at the Methodist and the Presbyterian, if the spiritual temperature begins registering red hot, I promise you, there will be light and salt permeating the darkness and the decay of our culture. The most of us believe that it needs to be, believes that it can be, thinks God wants it to be, and we know that we, what we need to do. But here's where we come into a little bit of a snag because if the spiritual temperature has not been red hot, <laughs> amen, then I have every reason to believe unless there is a transformation in Christians, the spiritual temperature will not become red hot. And there's one thing that stands between me and you and the spiritual temperature becoming red hot, and it's called the flesh. Now, let me tell you what's killing the Holy Spirit in my life and your life, mine and your flesh. You want to know how to turn him loose? Crucify the flesh. Come on, come on, come on. I dare you, dare you to explore the New Testament. And you're going to find in every incidence that which hindered the Holy Spirit was not education, was not, listen up, was not uh, socioeconomic, that which hindered the Holy Spirit had nothing to do with what people had or what people didn't have. What hindered the Holy Spirit? They were full of themselves, and as long as I'm full of myself, I will never be filled with God. Now, there's where we are, gang. Come on. There's where it is. How do I turn the Holy Spirit loose? Crucify the flesh, and he'll come alive. Come on, amen. He already is in you. I'm going to tell you something that will maybe blow your mind. If you will pray that you crucify the flesh, you will never have to ask the Holy Spirit to manifest himself. Do you have to tell an apple tree to bear fruit? Do you have to ask a pear tree to bear pears? Come on. I'm just saying to you, here's the, here's the deal, gang. I believe the enemy, the enemy is so deceptive. And I'm wondering if the enemy hasn't got us praying for the Holy Spirit when you ought to be praying for a crucifixion of yourself. And the Holy Spirit that is in you, the Holy Spirit that is in you will rise up and begin working through you. You say, I don't know how to receive the Holy Spirit. First of all, you already have received the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, I, on the authority of Scripture, the Holy Spirit is in you. If he isn't in you, then you do not belong to Jesus. I didn't say that. Paul did. He's there. Turn to, turn to your neighbor and say, I've got him. Now, now, turn to your neighbor and say, now, would you please pray that he could get me? <laughs> because the flesh has me. Myself has me. I, I, I was going to give it to you, and, and, I, and Lord William, the next time I, that I speak, I, I'll share it with you. Denzel Washington has one of, this, one of, the, one of the great, well, I'm, a, I'm ahead of myself. What's that got to do with anything? Okay, so watch this. Here we go. Uh, so uh, our problem is, is we, we're not willing to humble ourselves, repent, and seek and follow his ways for the healing of our land. We, we do, uh, why do uh, I know this is the case? The church, the Christians in our past hasn't done it. What we have been for, and you've heard me say this, for 50 years has certainly not been bad, but it hasn't been enough to change the culture for righteousness. You say, Pastor, I wish that you would quit saying that. You wish I quit saying that, not because it is boring you, but because it is challenging you. What I did in pastoral ministry for 42 years was not bad. But from where I'm standing this morning, it wasn't enough. 
And the reason that I say that it wasn't enough is look at our culture. There is no way that you can coincide a church on fire for Jesus. And when I say church, I don't mean one local congregation. But there's no way that you can coincide. There's no way that you can reconcile in your mind how the church in America could be on fire for Jesus and the culture being decaying at the same time. Can't be. Can't be. So I'm here to say to you, what I was in ministry for 42 years, not bad, but, it, but it, where I'm standing this, this, from where I'm standing this morning, it has not been enough. And I've got to repent of that. I have repented of that. And you've got to repent of that. Nobody's saying you wasn't a Christian. Nobody's saying you're not saved. Nobody's saying you're not going to heaven. But we are saying what we have been as Christians in this country has not been enough to bring light and salt to a decaying and dark culture. Now, think about this. So if what I've been for 42 years wasn't enough, what makes me think somehow it will be enough in 2023 if I keep doing what I've done the past 42 years? Do you know the definition of sanity, of insanity? <laughs> keep doing what you've always done and expecting different results. Yes, we Christians apparently think just keep doing church like we've been doing church with a minor tweak here and there and the results will somehow be different. Beloved, it's not about a minor tweak. It's about a full sold out repentance. The flesh has gripped me and gripped you and American Christianity condones goodness. So, here we go. Uh, if the church goes into the world without the intention to change the world, I promise you, the world changes us. If we go into the world without the intentions to change it, it changes us. If we don't change culture, culture changes us, and that's been the case for decades. And here we are, barely surviving the culture. Some suggest that Christianity as we know it won't survive the continued uh, culture in this decline. This is one reason that kids and student ministries paradigm must shift from teaching kids how to survive the culture to training them to how to change the culture. To change our culture, you don't go into a defensive mode and try to survive until something changes. Think about this. We as, oh my goodness, I'm meddling for sure now. We as Christian, the Lord gave me this. The Lord gave me this. Here's what I believe the Lord said. Gary, I want you to get Christians. I want you to get Christians as fired up about making me Jesus, their Lord and master, as they, are about, as they were about making Donald Trump president. <laughs> now, if you, was, if you was fired up about making Donald Trump president, I, I, you know, I, I hear you, I hear you. But I'm telling you, think about something with me just for a moment if you would. Are we not, now listen, are we not trying to survive this culture until something changes? And I'm saying to you, let's go change the culture. And beloved, something will definitely change. Let's those of us who have salt and light, go change the culture. Whatever Christianity has been in our nation for the past 50 years must change. Change from Christianity, American style, to New Testament standard of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We must see and confess our era of the past and repent and be transformed by, into a New Testament standard of being a disciple of Jesus. 
I pray that we see the shallowness, the lack of depth in Christian living in America. I pray that we see uh, that we are not that we see that we are not salt and light in a dark, decaying civilization. I pray that we see our light has been put under a basket and no one is finding their way home. I pray that we see that our salt has lost its savor and culture has decayed. I pray that we see our love for the Savior is lukewarm and heaven is in a state of regurgitating. As long as we think the church of the past years is okay, then a call to repentance and turn to something that is more New Testament centered is a mute point. The church of the past is not okay. If it was, we would not be in the mess that our community and our country is in because salt and light, salt preserves and light informs and shines. Bill Neese writes, and I quote, since the time of Old Testament judges, the spiritual condition of God's people has alternated between awakenings and apostasies. The spiritual tide of the church, he goes on and says, has always ebbed and flowed. Think about it. And as you study the history of the church, you can see. You will see that, that there was times that the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was oceans. And the book of Acts is a good place to look at that ocean, sweeping people into the kingdom. Come on, amen. But if you study history, you also know there is times that the anointing and the light of the gospel and the proclamation of the good news was a narrow stream. Do you know why we refer to those as the dark ages? from a Christian perspective, was because the light was so little and the salt was so sparse. I'm getting ahead of myself, so I won't quote, but I have a quote here by Larry Stocksteel, and I'll give it to you just in a second. He goes on, Dr. Neese does. So whatever, he says this, whatever position the church occupies, the world soon reflects. As the church goes, so goes the world. But looking at the moral condition of our world, I would say the church is in a serious state of apostasy. Larry Soxio writes, and I quote, it's amazing to me, he says, that as our churches grow larger numerically, our nation grows darker morally. The church seems obsessed, he says, with growth and relating to the American culture rather than repenting and changing the American culture, end of quote. God has begun judgment at his house for Christianity's duplicity, judging to discipline us not to destroy us, judging to awaken us, to revive us, to correct us, so our world will be changed through us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, come on gang, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. God has ordained only one method to do radical surgery upon society, only one means by which he invade mankind's problem with a supernatural solution. If my people will, then I will. The implication is, if my people don't, then I won't. And beloved, we haven't, and he hasn't. How many of you are up for changing the world? How many of you are up for changing the church, making it more and more like New Testament disciples and less and less like American Christianity? God isn't calling this country back to him. He is calling this church back to him, and the country will follow. And that's why I believe there is thousands of tens of thousands of men and women across our country who God has put a dream in their heart and a mental image in their mind. If you will fall madly in love with me and if you'll, if you'll get off your fix that is self-intoxicating, come on, amen, Ah, oh, beloved, we know this. We know this. Many of our churches have relegated themselves to being hardly more than just a stop where you can get a dispense of a fix that gets you through. Rather than call our church, many of our churches 
And, hey, and, and see, I can say this and not be critical because I was one of them. That's, that's kind of what I thought about I, or, or didn't even, maybe even didn't think about until, until I began to see things and, and the Holy Spirit began speaking and bringing things to my attention in Scripture. And, and, and so many of our churches, many of our churches, most of our sermons over the past have been more about helping you live with the results of satisfying your flesh without too much collateral damage. God forgive me for preaching sermons, because I preached them. God forgive me for preaching sermons that helped you to satisfy your flesh in some way or another manage the collateral damage of living after the flesh. May I never preach another sermon that doesn't call us as Christians not to satisfy our flesh and how we can do it, but to crucify our flesh. And I'm telling you, if the Bible is true and if it's not, we're all in a whole, well, well we're not in a heap of trouble. I mean, come on, amen. Really, think about it. So let's just say the Bible, nothing about the Bible is true, all right? So, so you get rid of the flesh can I tell you your relationship with your spouse and your children and your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers, co-workers will, will drastically be transformed? Can I tell you the flesh is what's breaking your relationships all to pieces? Come on. You say, I can't understand why I can't get in a healthy relationship. It's because you're filled with the flesh. And the works of the flesh doesn't do good for relationships because it's hatred and malice and unforgiveness. Come on, Amen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and peace and joy. Oh, that's the stuff. Gentleness, self-control, long-suffering. That's the stuff that builds good relationships with folk. So God is calling us back. God is calling us back. He's calling us. And you say, well, so we're saying we need to repent from, what do we need to repent to? What do I need to look at as a model? Get your New Testament and see what a disciple looks like that followed Jesus. Whoa! And I will tell you, him or her, him or her was just so fired up about following and honoring Jesus Christ. He was their first love. Yeah, God isn't calling this country back to him. He's calling this church back to him. I believe that we may be one sincere, repentive prayer away from a world-changing awakening. I believe it's in sovereign cards. Come on, amen. I believe, it's in God's, I believe it's in God's order to send an awakening to our country. Now, that don't mean one's coming. But if my people will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their self-intoxicating ways, wicked, and pray, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Could we be one repentant prayer away from a world-changing awakening? And you say, well, whose prayer is it? Yours. This is a call to repent from the flesh that you have followed. That needs to be your prayer. If you won't come and say, Holy Spirit, would you feel me? Hey, obviously, go for it. But I'm telling you, if you would pray, Holy Spirit, because of the work of Jesus, would you come and cleanse me from my flesh? Would you deliver me from my flesh? Would you set me free from my flesh that has control in my life? And I promise you, he will do a work and you won't even have to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh and anew with power and authority. I was praying, boy, I was. I was so praying. I was so praying, God, why are you not filling us with your Holy Spirit? Why, why are we so limited? 
And I believe, I believe that something in my inner spirit said, why would I want to turn you loose with more power to wreck your life if you're going to keep walking after the flesh? Why would I want to give you authority to do a better job of destroying yourself by walking after the flesh? Today, this is a call for me and you to repent. This is our call for a repentive prayer. Oh God, forgive me. I have lived my Christian life a great deal about doing it my way, on my terms, at my convenience. No more. I confess my flesh has controlled me, has influenced me, has greatly caused me to become this person that I have become. And I want to tell you, if your flesh has caused you to become this person, I want to tell you with all the love that I know how to tell you, you are not a pretty person. Because a flesh is ugly. Read Galatians 5, 22. But in, in reading Galatians 5, 22, just go up to Galatians 5, 18, and you'll see how that the crucifixion of the flesh releases the power of the Spirit that is in you as a born-again believer. And boy, you see that stuff, malice and hatred, works of the flesh, witchcraft, wild parties. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's according to what translation you're reading from, but orgies you might read in some translations. All of this ugly stuff that we want to get rid of. And so this is our repentive prayer. And I would ask you to come and pray yours. Would you come? Just get up out of your seat and come.